It's time for the Nappy Time Lectures with the Amateur Sommelier. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, the Amateur Sommelier, and yes, we have another wine presentation. This one is about dealcoholized wine. Yes, it actually does exist. How do we get it, and what are the tasting notes? Well, we're going to find out in this lovely presentation. And yes, it looks so pretty, doesn't it? Does it stop? No? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Oh, there's only two objectives here. There's supposed to be a lot more. But we're going to identify the types of people that want to drink dealcoholized wine. We're going to describe the methodologies used to dealcoholize wine. And that's all we're going to do. So, what kind of sick freakazoid removes alcohol from wine? Well, for one thing, calorie counters. Yes, there is a lot of calories in alcohol in general. Wine, there's quite a few. I don't have numbers to actually back this up, unfortunately. But, if you, like me, have been off alcohol and a bunch of other things for a while... The waistline actually does decrease. I have noticed. I have lost weight. Although maybe it's entirely possible that I'm just a lot more sick than I think I am, and this is all a lie, and that would be really bad. Uh, pregnancies, uh, obviously. Alcohol harms the baby fetus, and it would be wise to not drink alcohol. So that is where non-alcoholic wine goes to. Recovering alcoholics, you know, they don't want to be tempted to drink alcohol again, so there should be a market for them. And abstainers in general, like myself. So how come I've never heard of non-alcoholic wine? Well, let's be frank, it's quite niche. It is 0.5% of the domestic total wine market because... Most people prefer to go to the other 99.5% of the domestic total wine market, where all the alcohol is, understandably. So that is where the nicheness comes in. Uh, mostly produced by three wineries in California. We have Sutter Home, we have Ariel Vineyards, and the Canandaigua Wine Company Incorporated. Yes, that is a mouthful. So, there are... Four methodologies to dealcoholize wine. There is thin film evaporation, which is also known as vacuum distillation. There is reverse osmosis. There is the spinning cone column. And there's thermal gradient processing. And most of the major producers will use reverse osmosis or spinning cone column for economic purposes. So let's start with vacuum distillation, the thin film evaporation. There's two major assemblies. There's a rotor, cylindrical, heated body. The wine, which is the product, is introduced above the heated zone, which you will see is number one on the next slide. And it is evenly distributed by the rotor over the evaporation surface. The speed of the rotor causes what are called bow waves, which create an optimum heat flux and mass transfer conditions, which sounds a lot like thermodynamics. It is. It is very confusing. I'll try not to go into it too much. And the volatile components, which is mainly alcohol, rapidly evaporate, while the non-volatile stuff, which is everything else, concentrates at the outlet. So, you have your feed there. It goes down, kind of circular, gyrates quite a bit. You have the concentrate all the way at the bottom. There's a bunch of heat, and the vapors go out in two areas to remove the volatile compounds, which would be the alcohol. We'll then go to reverse osmosis. So let's start with regular osmosis, which is the solution and water that are put on opposite sides of a per semi-permeable membrane to allow solute from solution to pass into the water. This creates an equilibrium concentration. In reverse osmosis, we have the solution, which will be the alcohol pumped against the membrane at a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. 
The smaller molecular weight compounds, such as the water and ethanol, diffuse selectively over the membrane. The large molecular weight compounds, meanwhile, which are the phenol and organic acids, are retained in the wine and concentrated. The water is added back in to create your non-alcohol reduced alcohol wine. And some places will actually add the must, which is grape juice, of the wine prior to being fermented added instead. Now the wine, the water I should say, kind of makes it quite dilute. Grape juice makes it, you know, more sweet. So whichever that which you prefer to add. And here is a grainy-ish picture, but essentially you have your wine in the base tank. You have this pump that pushes the wine through against the gradients through the reverse osmosis units. You have the alcohol in the water. Then you have a valve, which then is going to be able to transfer back your um, concentrated wine at a diluted concentration. And then you need to add back water or grape juice. This is the single most confusing methodology I've ever seen. So I'm going to try and explain this as best as possible. But essentially, a spinning cone column is this huge column that uses steam to separate volatile compounds, which is the alcohol, from liquids under vacuum. So there are a bunch of cones. They alternate rotating and stationary. The wine is fed at the top of the column as it flows down to the first stationary cone. And then the rotating cone underneath uses centrifugal force to spread the wine upward and outward. Basically, as the wine goes down, this rotating cone pushes the wine back up to the stationary. And eventually the wine will get guided to the next stationary cone to repeat the cycle of the rotating cone using the centrifugal speed to spread the wine upward and outward. And eventually just goes all the way to the bottom as the liquid left over. The steam is introduced at the bottom of the column to go up and it's called strip the volatile compounds, which is the alcohol. Uh, the volatile compounds go in a separate condenser. And I'm just going to show this next slide. So on the very left is the actual column itself. It is a monstrosity. So you have on the left your inlet for the wine. There are a bunch of cones, which I believe are in the green, possibly. That's what I think it is. I think it's the green. And then you see there's the liquid outlet at the bottom. The gas vapor inlet is where the steam goes in. And the vapor with the volatiles, which is the alcohol, is at the top of the right. And in the middle is the cones of interest. You have the spinning cone in the very center, the stationary cone. It looks like it's on the outside. And then you have the actual shaft where the wine goes in. So it'll spread up outward. And then it will go into the stationary cone. I guess it overflows somehow and then goes to the next rotation cone. And then on the right, you have the vapor flow. You have the liquid flow. And the entire uh, shaft that's spinning all the while. That's about the best I'm going to be able to explain it. Unfortunately, I'm very unfamiliar with all the technology involved in this, much less the physics. If you want to read more about it? There's the website. Last but not least is the most inefficient process of all of these, which is the thermal gradient processing. Basically, you have your wine. You have it in a tank. So you cool the wine to form ice crystals that float to the top which increases the alcohol concentration in the tank. And you're going to stare at me, understandably, when I read this and say, we're trying to get rid of wine. How does this happen? 
So the tank is heated to melt the ice crystals, which dilutes the wine in the tank, and it's supposed to decrease the alcohol contents. Not entirely sure how, because you're going to have to do this multiple times, and there wasn't a good picture to visually demonstrate, so good job, Google. But it is very energy intensive. It's not being used commercially because you obviously have to cool the wine down to make the ice crystals. Then you got to heat the tank back up to get rid of the ice crystals to have them melt into the wine, which somehow dilutes the alcohol, even though you um, have water to make wine to begin with. So, well, it's Stanley Grape Juice, actually. I think it's not. Maybe I just mistook entirely. I have no idea. Either way, it's it's very odd. And it is cool and all. But um how does it even taste? And I have actually found two bottles for future consumption. The Stella Rosa, there's a red and a black. So those will be tried in the future. I actually off my antibiotics at the end of this upcoming week. It sounds about right. And then, let's see, I go back to my PPI, just do that, and then I have to kind of go off that before I get tested again for H. pylori, and then we'll see what happens. But, it is supposed to have a similar profile to regular wine. Now, the flavor is going to be less intense. Characteristics also less intense, because the alcohol accentuates certain types of things. It's going to feel more light-bodied and much thinner in the mouth. So you're going to be like, wow, this is like essentially watered-down wine is really what it comes down to. It's very watered-down. Like you can still point out some of the things, but you're like, meh. And if you add grape juice and, or must instead of the water, it could be sweeter. Again, I'm not entirely sure. Also, fun and interesting fact from the bottles that I've seen around most of these non-alcoholic wines all have carbon dioxide, and I'm not sure why, because I really just don't like carbonation in my wine, so I don't know. Maybe it's a thing. I'll have to check back with all y'all on that. And if you don't really want to go through like going to the store let's say you have a bottle of wine that you want to just take the alcohol out yourself you're having a hard time finding non-alcoholic wine like i do is there a home method that can be done and there is so you get a large pot you're gonna need something that's gonna hold the entirety of the bottle of wine which is 750 milliliters so, get a big one. Wine goes in. You are going to have to boil the wine, and I've tried to look up specific times. And everybody's like, boil the wine! But they don't really say how long. So what I was able to find was a range between 45 and 90 minutes. The 45 minutes is for reduced alcohol wine. 90, I think is for almost total removal. Um, you will have to have a lid to cover the boiling wine with ideally kind of like a little circular slot that will allow the alcohol to escape. The wine taste will change. So be very careful doing this. If you do try it and it's like, ooh, this is my very favorite bottle of wine, oh, but I need to, like, not have the alcohol in it. Let me just boil it. Be warned. Um, I would say if you have a very expensive prize bottle of wine to just not boil it and leave the alcohol in um, until you're able to drink alcohol and if you just can't whatsoever... I mean, I guess give it a shot, but you may not like the results. Um, leftover wine should be poured back into the bottle or a decanter. And any necessary volume replacement should be done with either, you know, water or grape juice. 
again. I have not tried it. Not sure if I recommend it because I just don't know. And so, in conclusion, uh, non-alcoholic wine does in fact exist. There are a few methods of production to make non-alcoholic wine, but it's still niche. It's only about 0.5%. There is a growing trend due to medical necessity and personal preference. And while I'm unable to verify the profiles at this time, there may be future videos on the channel which will cover some non-alcoholic wines. Certainly, if I have to wait all the way until September to go back to the GI office to verify I don't have H. pylori, if I still have symptoms or something of that nature, then, oh boy, this is about to get a really fun exercise. And then, of course, we have all of the sources being provided to me. And so thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I will be back in a week! Maybe I actually have to make the next presentation, but ideally, in a week! With another wine lecture. Good night, everybody.